Calm your mind. Go with the flow. The goals of an internal artist. Intercept. Uproot. Adapt. Unbalance. Neutralize. Control the center. And counter. Never check your brains at the door of a martial arts school. Remain centered at all times. This is the Internal Fighting Arts Podcast, a real-world conversation about the internal martial arts and philosophy of Chinese Gong Fu. Here is your host, Ken Gullet. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 16th episode of the Internal Fighting Arts Podcast, Sweet 16. My guest today is Byron Jacobs. He's a Xing Yi student who is from South Africa, but he moved to Beijing to study with Master Di Guoyang. I think you'll find his story inspiring. I had never heard of Byron until someone who listens to this podcast suggested him as a guest. I checked him out, as I do everybody who's suggested, and I watched a short documentary online about him and his teacher. It was very obvious he would make a great guest. I'll talk with him in a moment. But first, I want to bring in my sidekick, a legend of Hong Kong Kung Fu films, and a man who got a full refund from his anger management class when he sidekicked the instructor. Good to see you, Hung Lo. Uh, so you've come to make trouble? No, I've come to do a podcast. Damn you! Well, anyway, we're doing one. Hung Lo, have you ever done any teaching? I think it's safe to say that my brother and I are probably the best teachers in the province. He trains the feet, and I the fists. Well, good for you and your brother. I didn't start teaching until 1997, about 24 years after I began studying martial arts. I didn't really think about teaching until around 1990 or so. By the time I began teaching, I was 44 years old. I had just earned a black sash in Yili Chen Kung Fu. That's a style that included Jing Yi, Yang Tai Chi, and Bagua. I started teaching and very soon realized that teaching martial arts is a real lesson in itself. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, when you start teaching, you can go at least a couple of different ways. For some instructors, they feel as if they know everything. But for me, teaching revealed to me what I didn't know. When I started teaching and I had teenage students watching me carefully and asking questions, suddenly I felt the pressure to be perfect. I had to know the material cold and be able to perform it perfectly. Feeling that pressure made me practice even harder than I had ever practiced before. After I started teaching, for several years I would practice not just every day, but when the weekend came, I would practice six hours or more each day. You must be crazy! I wanted to be a good teacher, and to be a good teacher I believed that I needed to keep developing my own skills. Mm. Sounds like a good idea. And I still feel that way. <laughs> oh, I see. One of the things we talk about in today's interview is the new student who wants to be a teacher before he even takes a class. In reality, being a teacher is quite a commitment, and it might not be the same experience as the image in your mind. Sometimes you get what you ask for. <laughs> So I think you should take a close look at your teacher. Does he or she pretend to know it all, or do they make it clear they are still continuing to learn? One thing that you'll notice about most of the guests I have on this program, even though most of them are teachers, they are all students too, and they admit it. If you're teaching, I would encourage you to make it clear to your students that you still are on the student journey yourself. And I think that's the problem with the title of Master. How many of us have mastered these arts? Not many. Have you, Hung Lo? I tell you frankly, I know that I'm the best fighter in the world. Right. Well, we'll bring in today's guest. Byron Jacobs was born in South Africa. He now lives in Beijing and has moved there to be close to his Xing Yi teacher, Master Di Guoyang. His website is diguoyangwushu.com. That's D I. G-U-O-Y-O-N-G-W-U-S-H-U D-Guoyangwushu.com Byron, thank you for joining me today. This is uh, probably the most long distance 
interview I've done, you are now in Beijing, right? Yes, I've been living in Beijing permanently since about the end of 2009. But you grew up in South Africa. Tell me、uh, a little bit about growing up there. Well, to be honest, I've got quite a well-traveled、uh, life. So I was born in South Africa, and I lived there until I was about six-ish, and then I moved to Brazil, where I lived for about two years, a year and a half, two years, and then from there I actually lived in the USA, in Kansas City and Atlanta, for、uh, roughly four years before moving back to South Africa, and I spent the rest of my time there until I came here to to Beijing. Incredibly well-traveled. Yes,、um, and、uh, I think that's one of the things that actually helped me、uh, have a bit more of an open mind about different cultures. So I think that was a good thing. Why did you move so much as a child? My stepfather was an engineer, and、uh, he was based in different places for projects for work. So、uh, depending on where a project was, he would move around, and we'd move with him. I've heard that you became interested in martial arts in a similar way that I did. You saw a Bruce Lee movie. Is that how it started for you? That's my earliest recollection.、Um, was watching Bruce Lee movies. My mom says that from a young age, anything to do with the Orient,、uh, with Asia and China and Japan, just got me interested. But、uh, I think it stemmed from watching martial arts movies and the. The link that martial arts had to China and Japan, so it kind of sparked something in me when I was young, and I was just hooked from then. <laughs> yeah, for me, the first I guess a lot of us saw in the U.S. was Bruce Lee and Kato, but it really didn't register with me like the Kung Fu TV show did with David Carradine. And then when Bruce Lee hit, it was all over. I had to start studying at that point. That's actually quite funny that you you mentioned that TV show because. While I don't personally remember watching it on TV, my mom remembers me continuously wanting to watch it, and、uh, of my limited vocabulary at the time, <laughs> continually saying things like "kung fu, kung fu, kung fu" because I wanted to watch this kung fu TV show. <laughs> so, how did you start in the martial arts? What did you first study? Well, you know, whatever was around me, and that was generally、uh, the first class was、uh, what they offered at the primary school that I went to, which was judo. So I started with、uh, judo as a formal class, and that's what I started with. My dad and his, particularly his oldest brother. My dad has has two brothers. His older brother was a karate instructor, and both, all three of them did karate. So. I was exposed to that as well,、um, to a degree. But the first formal training I had was in judo, which I, I actually am quite grateful for because、um, I think it gives you a good foundation、uh, in terms of、uh, a physical training. I think it's a good foundational art. Yeah, and what did you go to from there? How old were you? Well, from there, because of the moving around, it was very difficult to stick to a single school, or at times even a single style. And、uh, mm -hmm. in moving around, I, I moved around between different, mostly Japanese styles, whether it was either a karate class or a a mixed eclectic. That was one of the ones that I started doing later in my teens. Was an eclectic type of a Japanese school where he did various weapons as well as empty hand stuff. But I think he had put it together from Various things that he had studied in in the Japanese field. From all that time, I'd always been looking and interested to find a Chinese martial arts teacher, and、um, that only happened in my teens when I was back in South Africa. And didn't you say you came across your teacher, Diko Yong? Through a DVD? Yeah, actually, I mean, I'd already been doing Chinese martial arts for quite a long time by that point. I started to do.、Uh, What would be considered as contemporary or, or wushu sport, basically in a semi-professional manner. Before that, and I had、uh, competed both nationally in South Africa and internationally a, a little bit in that time. I basically straight out of high school, I found a teacher that had moved to South Africa from China, and he had a background in in both、uh, sport wushu as well as traditional. Uh, Chinese martial arts,、uh, quite a quite a rare style of mantis. It was a combination of uh, uh, Xingyi and Bagua with、uh, with with seven star mantis that originated in Shanxi but moved to Inner Mongolia. He was from Inner Mongolia, and I went to his school basically to look for somebody that could teach me. I was interested. I was young. I wanted to do some competitive wushu, and he he had this background. But he was in another town, so I moved into the school. I literally lived in the school、uh, Monday to to Friday, and would be back on on Sunday. 
and it was a warehouse in an industrial area um, without a shower. I used to wash out of a bucket, all for the love of the, the art. But I was basically there training multiple sessions a day doing wushu sport. Uh, but um, his sister was coming from China and she was actually a professional wushu athlete in her past. So that was what uh, I was waiting for so I could start learning with her. And she did come, and that was what I focused on. Uh, and, I, and, and well, her generation of uh, of wushu athletes was an older generation. Well, they had learned from the first generation, so it's a little bit different to today because in the first generations they still had a lot of traditional foundation. For example, I was doing changchuan or long fist, and our foundation was traditional tangtui sets and cha chuan sets and basic techniques and uh, combinations from northern traditional styles, that was our foundation. And then, and then you create or compile a competitive routine or do one of the standardized routines. So I had a bit of exposure in traditional training in that sense too, especially uh, being with her brother as well. So I dabbled in his traditional style as well. Explain sport wushu to us. You know, it does get a little bit uh, of a bad rap sometimes. I agree it does, and, it, and in a sense I also agree it should at times. Wushu sports, it, while it is misunderstood, it is exactly that, it's sport. And this is where I think a lot of people, this is where the, the misunderstanding comes in, both from the traditional people and both from the sport people. Traditional people are trying to think that it's trying to replace what they're doing. It's not, it's, it's a sport. And sport people at times are a little bit ignorant and in denial that what they're doing is actually sport and it's not traditional wushu. And I don't think there's a problem with this separation. I think that if our people are honest about it, they'll understand very clearly that wushu sport is a sport that was derived from traditional martial arts. I mean, we all know that traditional martial arts, they're not sport orientated. Their goal is not to go out and win a medal. Um, it's not to go out and compete with somebody in an exhibitional form. It's, it's something deeper than that and a lot more complicated, a lot more profound. But what we see, you know, in the 1900s was China opening up and we see uh, West becoming more exposed to China and vice versa. And we know that the West was, I mean, Western idea and concept of sport and the competitive nature of sport, the Olympic movement, etc. It's not something that uh, can easily be copied and pasted onto Chinese lifestyle. But the Chinese really wanted to have a unique cultural sport of their own. And this is the roots of the development of wushu sport. It started to move into a realm with a direction to try create a Chinese sport. And the best option for that was what, what is called the, the marrow of the nation, which is Chinese martial arts. It was based on that. So this is what the origins of wushu sport are. Over time, while trying to conform and to fall into the mold that the West understands as sport, Wushu has gone through a lot of changes, a lot of uh, things have been taken out, the direction of, of certain practices have been changed, all in the name of trying to create this sport. And, and it's not a perfect process. This is what a lot of people don't understand. Nobody's going to have the answers from day one. They're going to try to do something, implement it, and then you'll see what happens after a few years of, of this process being applied. Uh, for example, rules, for example, all of these things, they, it's an evolutionary process. And the good thing is that if you've got the right person with the right mind looking at this development and looking back, you can have things changed in a positive way taking into consideration all the faults and the mistakes that have happened. So Wushu over time lost a lot of its real essence trying to become a sport. Uh, this is without doubt. And as, a, as an ex-Wushu athlete, it took me many years to actually identify and see this. And many athletes won't understand this because, well, they, all they've got exposure to is Wushu sport and they at times come from a teacher who comes from a pure wushu sport background. Luckily, my background with my teachers, they come from a martial family and just one of them happened to be involved in sports. So they had a little bit of a different perspective. But a lot of people don't. They get taught by an athlete or a third or a fourth generation athlete and that's what he's done. He's gone from cradle to the wushu school 
to becoming an athlete, to becoming a coach, and so on. There is nothing in between that he has experienced to change his viewpoint. His whole life has been based around sport. So this is where Wushu's difficulty lies today, uh, trying to balance between sport development and not trying to lose too much of itself. And I'm glad I'm involved in Wushu because I feel that my involvement in the International Wushu Federation, especially in the technical committee where I'm involved, I can try to make a positive change in, in the other direction. That's great. How difficult was it training as a Wushu sports person? Well, the first thing is that we try to to be athletes as hobbyists. That's the first, big, the biggest problem we have in the West. Uh, some countries now, China has had a professional wushu environment with athletes that are paid to train and that's all they have to worry about. They've got the facilities, they've got the coaches. Uh, but the West, we, we look at that, try to emulate it, but we don't have the same environment. That's the first obstacle most people have is they're trying to balance being, uh, they're supporting themselves with this dream. Um, so as much time as you can you can uh, put into it, it's not as much time as the professional athletes do. And the other thing is a lot of us start quite late, and it's physically demanding. So your body at times is under some serious stress, when, whereas if you compare it to somebody who's been doing it from five or six, their body isn't under as much stress trying to do these di difficult techniques, uh, aerial techniques, etc., which are really physically demanding. So the second uh, difficulty most Wushu athletes have is injury, and that's what happened to me. Um, I've had three knee surgeries on both knees over the course of my career, and that was the third one where I, I remember getting, recovering, going through rehabilitation, starting to train again, waking up in the morning to go to a training session and walking to the bathroom and looking in the mirror and asking myself, what am I doing? What is the purpose of this? It was like an epiphany moment. I asked myself, why am I doing this? And I couldn't answer that question. I couldn't answer that question because I had started Chinese martial arts for the love of Chinese martial arts, not for the love of a gold medal. And I think it was at that point that I kind of pulled myself back on track and I realized, well, your body is saying enough with this competitive stuff. Now your heart is telling you to follow your traditional road that you wanted to follow. And that's when I, I'd always been interested in Xing Yichun. So I, I decided, well, I'm going to give my my 100% to to following that road. And uh, I'm still in it. I'm still, I'm still on that road. And how old were you when you made that decision? I was in my 20s. So I was probably around 20 or 24. Wow, that seems awfully young. Seems like you would have a lot left, but that shows what kind of a young person sport wushu is, I guess. It really is. I even remember the last time I attended a training session in China to prepare. I was training at the, the, a professional team, the Shishahai Sports School in Beijing, which is where Jet Li comes from. And waking up in the morning and going downstairs and all these other athletes both local and some international are at least five or six years younger than me and I just felt like the elephant in the room you know literally <laughs> so yeah did you find your teacher through a DVD did you begin tracking him down because of that and I, I believe I had that same DVD yes actually I mean I, I wanted to start pursuing studying Xing Yichuan and uh, on one of my wife, wife's trips to the mainland I asked her well Pick me up a DVD that I can start looking at least at some fundamentals before I find a teacher. And the one that she bought was Di Guo Yong's DVD. And I was firstly surprised at his clarity of instruction and clarity of movement. And secondly, his character seems to kind of shine through through the DVD. And you could just kind of tell that there's something different about this guy. He seems like an open-hearted, generous kind of a person. And it was from that that I started trying to look for him. I started doing online searches. I found out that he has a student in Canada. Her name is Andrea Falk, who translated his Chinese Xinichuan books into English. Yes. And I contacted her saying, look, I really want to find this teacher. And I know you translated his DVDs. I thought I was going to run into a wall, as you normally do with a lot of Chinese martial arts people. For some reason, they think they're defending the colonel's secret recipe. <laughs> but she just openly said, here's his telephone number, here's his email address, get in contact with him. And uh, I did, and I uh, arranged to come to China before I'd actually moved here. 
I think the first time I spent about a month and a half, maybe two months here, training with him as my initial training session, training time with him. And I think that was probably around 2008 or 2007, somewhere around there. How did you meet your wife? She is Chinese, right? Yes, she's from Beijing. Um, like I said, her brother actually had come to South Africa to teach, and he had called her to come and help because she was uh, uh, more professional. She was an ex-professional athlete. She was also then drafted into the Chinese special, like the, it's called Wujing, but it's, uh, I could say, you could say it's kind of like special forces uh, to represent the special forces Wushu team. She had come to South Africa to teach. Um, I was living in the school. Well, of course, I was then told to teach her English. <laughs> she would teach Wushu, and I would teach her some English. And, you know, people are together for a long time. You know, they generally get closer, and, you know, things happen. And uh, <laughs> she became my wife a few years later. But uh, we've been together in martial arts ever since. So how did you learn uh, Chinese? When I was in primary school, um, again, with my whole infatuation with martial arts. I had then, at that point, been back in South Africa, and I was an immigrant, considered an immigrant, because I'd lived overseas for a few years, and uh, I didn't speak the local... There's a, there's a second language at that time that we had to learn at school, which is a, a form of local Dutch that I just couldn't really speak. So I was always thrown into the immigrant class for that, which, of course, I was surrounded by Taiwanese and Chinese kids that had happened to also just immigrate to the country who turned out, obviously, to be my best friends. And when they were going into high school, a few of them had gone to the Chinese school, which is, uh, was a, a, school, a high school. In, it's actually an all-age school in South Africa at that time. It doesn't exist anymore. It was initially opened by the Taiwanese government. Uh, to cater to Chinese or Taiwanese immigrants, uh, and then um, I, when I got into high school, I went to that school, and uh, of course Mandarin is one of the subjects there. The classes are all in English because they follow the government uh, prerequisite for the curriculum, but they have an additional language center where immigrants from Taiwan or China would go into to have intensive English classes for four or six months before they would get slowly put into mainstream classes. Um, and of course, we had Mandarin as an additional language in our curriculum. Uh, we had very interesting extracurricular activities which were different as well, such as lion dancing, Chinese cooking. There was also a martial arts club, uh, uh, things that just weren't the norm. And that's where I went. That's where I did my high school. That's fantastic. I'm from Kentucky, and so I barely speak English. I have been very frustrated with Chinese masters who I couldn't communicate with except through physical means. It must be a tremendous advantage to speak the language. Yeah, I can say it really does help to understand some fairly complicated elements of training. Um, but it's also good to be able to have a personal relationship with your teacher. I mean, for example, my teacher, who's, who's my shirfu, we really have a quite a, a family kind of relationship. So it's not, not necessarily that I'm only talking to him when I'm training, but we get together and have discussions just over tea and a meal quite often. Uh, he's currently right now visiting his daughter in Australia. He has been for the last two months. And just this afternoon, I mean, I Skype called him just to see how things are going. So it's very good to be able to have a, a closer relationship with, with your teacher. And I think that's one of the things that Chinese martial arts is really based on, is that, that type of a family relationship. How difficult was it to make the decision to move to Beijing? It wasn't difficult, for me at least. From 2002, being involved in, in Wushu and being a training in competitive Wushu for quite a few years, at that point in 2002, there was still no international Wushu Federation member in South Africa. There wasn't a national Wushu Federation. There was a some kind of a national Chinese martial art federation, but it wasn't affiliated to anyone. And I started the process to develop. I actually founded the federation. Um, so I was doing quite a few things at the same time. I was trying to set up and establish a federation. I was trying to manage it. I was also an athlete in training. I was also in charge of trying to spread standardized IWF Wushu sport. Uh, wushu that I had been doing for a while, but was almost alien to the rest of the Chinese martial artists there. And after quite a few years, I mean, unfortunately, and this is the situation in many countries, Chinese martial arts doesn't really get government funding. Many times it doesn't even get government recognition from the sports authorities, from the sporting government. So 
most people develop a wushu federation out of their own pocket and out of their own time and i had done that for so long i'd been doing it for before it actually got established i had been obviously starting to do this process and after seven or eight years of doing that and my wife she had her school i would also coach there we would you know we'd have students it didn't have anything that was holding me there it was i'd started it things were running in the federation but you know, as I said, I had that epiphany, I needed to do something for myself, not for anybody else. I needed to do something for myself. Uh, after I met my teacher, I thought, this isn't going to work if I come and see him once a year or twice a year for a couple of months. It's, it's not going to work. Time goes by in the blink of an eye. And uh, I mean, he's a senior teacher. He's not, he's not a spring chicken. So I wanted to spend as much time close to him as possible. So I decided to to come to China. I mean, uh, without any job prospects, without any idea, I just decided, well, let's try. And that's, uh, we came. Was your wife in favor of moving back? Yes and no. No, because of the uncertainty of what we were going to do. Yes, because I'm sure you've heard that South Africa is not the safest place in, in the world, especially where I was in Johannesburg. So it is quite a stressful place to live in with the crime rate and things like that. So in that sense, she was quite happy to be out of that. Now, for most of us, if we moved to Beijing, we would suffer quite a bit of culture shock. What were some of the things you had to go through? Or was it a smooth transition considering how much you had traveled? No, it's, it's always going to be a culture shock. Maybe now not as bad as before, but the first time I started coming to China every year since about 2001 or 2002, and that's not so long ago, but Beijing was very different then. Um, my first trip to China actually involved me landing in Beijing and getting on another plane and flying to Inner Mongolia in the middle of winter. That's your culture shock. When you, when you land there, I mean, it's very different to a big city in Beijing, especially at that time. It was quite... Uh, what's the word? Rustic? I don't know what, the, what a positive term is, but it was different. I think the first thing people are not used to is the toilets. I think that's the first thing Westerners have their first shock at, uh, public toilets. <laughs> uh, and the smaller towns, public toilets, which are not only ones that you have to squat on, but they just don't have walls between, <laughs> between uh, the patrons. You, uh, I remember the first time in Inner Mongolia when we were outside at a market, and I needed to go to the restroom. And I, I told my wife, all right, I'm going to go to the restroom. And I walked in there. And there was quite a lot of uh, chatting going on before I'd even walked in. And there were two or three guys squatting without the walls next to each other, having the biggest and most, uh, what's the word, lively conversation at the same time. And I walked in and the conversation died because they're probably not used to seeing a white guy. And I was staring at them like, this is just the strangest thing. I didn't go to the restroom. I, I, I held it in until I went home. But that's, that's probably the first thing that you get in terms of culture shock. But there are other elements. And, you know, I think it's, uh, it's, it's not so bad. If somebody goes with an open mind, you'll get used to it. But it takes a bit of time to get used to yeah, I think I would lock up if I walked into a situation like that. So how long does it take you to get used to that? Um, I don't know. I mean, for me, I got used to it pretty quickly. I think there's other elements of Chinese life today that would that are more problematic for me than those little things like uh, cultural differences. I think right now there's uh, bigger problems here that would put you off. You mean the uh, pollution? Pollution is one thing. Social breakdown in a certain sense is another. I mean, uh, Chinese people are modernizing very quickly and uh, way of life has changed so drastically. It's become a very financially driven people. Uh, it's all about the money. I, I remember in the beginning I'd come to China and uh, there's a lot of street vendors that sell food and you'd think this is heaven because the food looks really good and there's so much variety and at times I would buy it and eat it. But nowadays you can't even do that because you can't even trust the food on the street that a vendor is trying to sell you. He could be selling you meat that's rancid and he's just fried it and and spiced it in a way that you wouldn't really tell. It's, you know, it's become such a financially driven place that a lot of morals and there's been a bit of a social breakdown. So, look, I, I might make it sound worse than it actually is, but it is there. And, when, you know, if you come here on a holiday, you might not see it or be exposed to it. But living here, you do kind of, you know, you know the, the light from the dark. And uh, 
that's one of the things that, that I would say is the, the worst part for me. Well, you know, as I got up this morning and turned on the news, one of the big stories today is the stock market situation in China. And I was wondering, does that impact the average person on the street in China? Have you heard them talking about this? Not at all. No, I, I mean, I haven't heard anybody talk about it in conversation to me. Possibly this affects the bigger companies to a degree. But, you know, the Chinese financial system is so regulated. I mean, it's like, I don't know if you've heard, even even the Chinese stock market that you're, you're mentioning is not really open for foreigners. It's like there's a domestic stock market, there's an international stock. Everything is so shrouded and so covered. The system... It's very difficult to ascertain. Most people are fine. Most people, they have their, their jobs. The government, uh, in terms of regulating things here, does a good job, so most people can afford to live. But uh, So I don't think it really affects them. I read another article a couple of days ago that said uh, a lot of politicians in the United States, as the 2016 elections start gearing up, are focused on ISIS and the Middle East crisis and other things. And yet... This person was saying that China down the road is a far bigger problem for the United States because they're gearing up militarily, they're building islands uh, uh, as bases. And Is there any kind of feeling in conversation over there by average people about this potential tension between these countries in the, down the road? Yes, in a sense there is. I wouldn't say they've specifically said that they want to go out and have war with countries, but there is a quite a stout patriotism and nationalism here, and it's become a little bit stronger, more, more than I would like in the last few years. I don't know if you remember in the beginning of the Senkaku Island debacle that started a few, few years ago, probably three or four years ago. I was here at that time, and there were protests in the street. They would have buses of people going to the Japanese embassy and protesting with very anti-Japanese slogans. Your average person in the street would say or proudly say anti-Japanese things. If they walked by a car that was a Japanese brand, they would just destroy it. So there is a type, there is a bit more nationalism, a little bit more aggressive nationalism lately than there was in the past. When I first came to China, uh, you know, 15 odd years ago, you would, it wasn't like this. It's a little bit stronger now. So, yes. Well, let's get back to Kung Fu. Dig uh, Guoyang, I'd like to uh, find out more about him as a teacher. You say he has a very clear style. And I was impressed by the documentary I watched online about how highly he speaks of you. You're like family to him, it seems like. How did that develop? I've got quite a, a, a serious work ethic, especially with martial arts, um, and it's been such a strong part of my life for so long. I don't really do anything half and half. So, I think as much as as much as I can say I worked hard, I can also say that it's it's because of his teaching and his method of teaching and his clear teaching and open teaching that I've been able to utilize it to develop. I think that any anybody who who practices with him and diligently will improve tremendously and of course then he'll praise you but you know I also try to to put in as many hours as humanly possible to improve my my practice and to develop as I can when I first came to China I, I still remember I mean the first time I trained with him he had uh, of course said to me oh what's your background he wanted to know about me I told him I was a wushu athlete and I you know I, physically I, I, I pretty I had a lot of experience and uh, he said, have you done Xing Yi before? And I said to him, yeah, well, I've learned a little bit from your DVDs and practiced for, for a bit of time. He said, okay, great, let me see your San Ti Shi, which is the basic, you know, Trinity posture. I said, okay, great, and I thought I had this thing down to a T, you know, San Ti Shi, it's just a standing posture. I didn't pay much attention to it when I was watching his DVDs either. I knew the basics, and there we go, let's move now, you know, that's the mentality I came from. And I stood in Santi Shu and he looked at me, he looked up down, he said, oh, okay, we're very far, uh, we'll start all over again. And I remember when he said that to me, I was slightly shocked. I said, whoa, uh, it's that bad, you know? And, uh, and a lot of people can go two ways with this. If you have your ego in the wrong place, you'll think, well, you know what? I've actually done this for a while and I'm not gonna stand here and be insulted. Of course, it's not that bad. 
But I went the other way, of course. I was like, well, that's what I'm here for, so let's start over. Treat me like a beginner. And he, he was quite nice. He was trying to be accommodating and saying, all right, what, you know, what is your goal to learn in this first period that you're going to stay with me? You know, what, what are your plans? I said, I just want to follow exactly how you want to teach me. If you want me to stand here for the next three months, I'll stand here for the next three months. And so I think he appreciated that. And I mean, at times, um, when, when he would, you know, he, we of course started with post standing uh, and he'd leave me there. We'd practice in a place that's either next to a park or in a park. And of course he knows everybody there, he's lived there his whole life, so he'll go off and have a conversation. And for example, we've got certain gungva, which are post standing exercises with slight, with slight movement. They're repetitive movement, but they're quite physically intense. And he'd leave me and, and he'd go and have a conversation with somebody and I'd be doing the one leg, for example, for 35 minutes, and then he'd come back and I'd be standing in a puddle of sweat, and he said, oh, you should have changed legs. And I was like, oh, all right. And so I think he appreciated my work ethic. That's great. Yeah, you hear stories about that from a legend of uh, someone standing in Santi for three years. And through training with Chen people, I've tasted some bitter. Um, how much bitter is there in the training? It sounds like quite a bit over there. With him, you know, like I said, he is quite an open teacher, so he doesn't want to break people. But if you want to do it the right way, it's bitter. It really is bitter. But his teacher did the three years in Santisha. Uh, his teacher stood in, in Santisha for three years. It all depends on the person, though. I mean, my teacher will look at you and see how, how quickly you grasp the, the basics before you can continue moving on. With me, what I did was I wanted to really lay a solid foundation. So... He made me stand in Santisha and we did various, we, he, we call them Nei Gung. Nei meaning internal and Gung, like Gung Fu, the Gung, like internal exercises. But I would say that that, doesn't, that term doesn't do it justice. It's a, uh, Santisha could be considered Nei Gung as well, except it's stationary. We have moving ones. And they're really physically intensive. And that was the foundation of my first uh, time that I spent with him. That's all I did was Nei Gung exercises for three hours a day. And I'm really grateful I did that. And to this day, that constitutes the beginning of my training. If I go train, whether it's with him or alone, the first hour at least are these Neikung or Kung Fa exercises, including Santi Shi, before I start moving. Describe one of those exercises for us. Uh, for example, the first one and one of the better ones, it's called Qi Luo Zhuang, which means rising and falling post Zhuang, as in Zhan Zhuang, as in standing post. It, it constitutes standing in a slightly wider stance than Santi Shi, and uh, with your arms coordinated with the motion of your body, your arms would go up as uh, your body sinks down into a squat. It's almost a single-legged squat with the other leg somewhat extended but not straight. And then rising, pushing the arms down uh, and shifting the weight forward into the front, stand, uh, front leg and repeating this up and down and up and down. And it's literally, it's, it's to build your base. But it's got more than that. These Gung Fa exercises and what I really like about them is that they start working on you in a subconscious level. So they start programming your body and your arms and, and things to move in a certain way subconsciously. So we develop a type of Shin Fa or body method through these Gung Fa exercises that work on different planes. This Qi Luo Zhuang develops P or splitting power, uh, which is like P Chen, the first element. It's a very big splitting energy, but it's a, it's a very detailed, coordinated motion between your arms, your body, and your legs. They're at specific points throughout the entire motion that support each other and work with each other. And I've personally found that these exercises develop the fastest grasp of the body method required for Xin Yi Quan. And of course, they develop the um, physical aspect that you need as well. So they're, they're very special exercises. I've seen Chen style people that have similar Gung Fa exercises. I'm sure you guys uh, uh, could relate with your silk reeling exercises, things like that. They start to develop a certain type of movement that just starts to become subconscious. It starts to become automatic. And then when you're learning a technique, the body method and the motion seems to come out 
already naturally. Your, your body already has an idea of how the best way to move is in this plane or in that plane or uh, with different uh, directions. It's, it starts to lay this foundation. That's a great way to define body method. Well, yeah, I think that uh, body method is the key to definitely to Xingyi, Bagua, and Tai Chi, but I, I think it's the key to all, all good martial arts. Mm -hmm. When you first began studying with uh, Di Go Yong, were you studying with other students? Were you accepted by other students being a, a foreigner? Initially, Di teaches openly on Saturdays and Sundays. In other words, he's got a place that he goes to on a Saturday morning and a Sunday morning. For years and years and years he's been doing this and he'll do it for the rest of his life, I'm sure. And his local students that uh, train with him will come if they can, you know, don't come if they cannot, but he's there either way. I was training with him those days and Monday to Friday. Monday to Friday, I was alone with him, unless some of one of the students had called or was coming in as well. Generally, I trained alone with him, except on the weekends. You know, he, he has got other foreign students that uh, come at times from other countries to study with him. But and he's had a few, um, like a couple of my uh, my older brother, my older um, in martial older brother. And sister, one one is from the UK, one is from Australia. That lived for stints of time in China, three or four years. And but other than that, there there wasn't really anybody with me Monday to Friday. Uh, it was just me and him. The other students, in terms of his Chinese students, generally accepted me. They're quite quite a nice bunch. They've you see, D is a very nice person. So I think. If you're going to stay studying with him, it can only affect you in that way. I mean, you're not going to be quite a, a hard ass uh, or uh, somebody that's not very friendly if your teacher is really open and warm to you. It generally changes you. So most of his students are, are quite open and, and warm. They were. Um, there are a couple of the oldest, the older ones that would like to feel you out a little bit, but they wouldn't do that in the beginning. They've actually, they actually started to do that after a bit of time. I want to go back for a second to those exercises you were discussing. Are there any of those online or, or on DVD? No, and uh, okay. even when those people came to film the documentary, because I start my training with that, he didn't want them to film any of that being done. Not because he's trying to keep it secret, but because it's so easily misunderstood, so easily misrepresented. Yes. So, yeah, um, maybe at a later stage he'll release something or we'll film some stuff together. But, uh, yeah, nothing at the moment. How old is he? He was born in 1948. Okay, so he's, he's not as old as I thought he might be. Well, and he's still physically very good, so I'm quite grateful about that. So. God, he's only five years older than me. Yeah. That's hard to believe. What is it about his Xing Yi that you like, uh, the, the style of Xing Yi compared with other martial arts? Well, for me, Xing Yi is nice because it's very direct. Uh, that's the first thing that attracted me to Xing Yi was it's direct. It's uh, got a huge force or power generation. Overbearing is a good word to, to explain it. It's, uh, well, how can I say? It's pretty no-nonsense. That's exactly it. It's no nonsense. It's direct. But the guy, you know, people that are good at Xingyi, they let off this kind of uh, aura of total domination. And that's what first initially attracted me to it. You know, it's funny. I've studied some Xingyi and I do uh, teach a little of it. We all got into this a little bit for self-defense, even if that becomes less of a reason down the road. But when people ask me, OK, if you are attacked on the street... Would you use Tai Chi? Would you use Bagua? And in my mind, if I, when I visualize what-if scenarios, the thing that comes to mind immediately is Xing Yi. Driving through somebody instead of trying to feel their energy and all that. It's a very practical martial art. I'm 62. I haven't been in a fight since I was 18 and don't expect to be. But it is something that you play in your mind, and I think Xing Yi is very practical. It is very practical, and that's exactly one of the reasons why it, I was so attracted to it. Yeah, like you say, you think about that, and you now if somebody comes into the street in the street and attacks you, yeah, Xing Yi, you deal with the guy very quickly. But the longer and the more I'm exposed to it, and the more I develop, and looking at my teacher's power generation, it's come to the point that. 
I would actually not want to use it unless it's really, really uh, required. Not in an open, you know, if you're having a bit of a sparring session with somebody, it doesn't matter. But if somebody's really attacking you and and you let loose with a very solid full body bung chuan, for example, I don't know what the result will be to that guy, but I don't think it's going to be very good. Oh, you could easily kill somebody. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you see guys being punched out on videos and they, they just fall like a, an empty suit and hit their head and uh, it can be pretty frightening. Yeah, actually, I don't know if you know that uh, quite a few years ago, Master D taught in Cameroon for about two years. And that was when he was young. I mean, he was a lot younger. And being a Chinese martial artist in, in a new country, in a country where karate and kyokushin and all of these styles were quite well developed, he had times when, when somebody would walk into the center that he was teaching at. He was teaching in somebody's school there. He had a couple of times where a karate cat came and physically openly challenged him. And, and uh, he told me of one situation where he, he knocked this guy down and the guy's head hit the wall. And that it was knocked out, and my, that was when my teacher really, really worried. So I, it's exactly as you say. It's you know they fall down and they hit their heads. You anything can happen. Mm -hmm. So how does a student study progress under your teacher? In what order do they learn things? Generally, as all Shingi begins, you'll start with Santi Shir and the five elements. He'll start teaching. You'll enforce your structure of Santi Shir, and then your structure while you start moving through five elements. The five elements are, are generally, the goal of them is to develop different types of force or energies while maintaining the structure and understanding one of the key concepts of Xing Yichuan, which is to strike while you move or as you land, basically. Um, it's quite different, and that's one of the things that I found quite quite unique about Xing Yichuan is that you're moving and striking. You're not moving, rooting, and striking. It all happens while you're moving. So to get that type of coordination, the hard, what we call liu he, uh, the external harmonies, is quite difficult. And that's generally what you'll work on. So you'll go through the, the, the five elements and you'll probably start to learn some of the linking, uh, five elements linking. Uh, after that, you will, you will probably start with the 12 animals, going through them one by one. Um, there's other traditional routines as well in between, which is a kind of combination of uh, five elements with some of the animals in it. D likes to focus on the spear, specifically the big spear, because it's so linked to Xing Yi, but it's so linked to your physical development of issuing force in Xing Yi. The vectors and the type of energy used and developed in, spe in spear, specifically a big spear, is directly related to your empty hand energies and your body method that is used to support those those movements. It's so closely linked to the spear. And he really loves the spear. He's really good at it as well. You know, I believe I saw you doing some spear or someone related to uh, him in, in that documentary. And I was uh, shocked at how, at the power that I saw in the internal body mechanics. It, it reminded me a lot of some of the good chin spear shaking that I've seen, pole shaking. Yeah, we do a lot of shaking as well. And I remember when he first introduced that to me, it was after a, quite a period of training, you know, you won't do it immediately. Um, and uh, he, he started me with shaking, literally getting, uh, I think at that time I had a three and a half meter spear. Uh, it's generally the one that he'll put on his bicycle and bring to training. And I started shaking this thing, it looks so easy, and I, he says here, follow me and he's shaking it. Now I grab this thing and I try to shake it and I, I was more tired in five seconds than I had I would have been if I had sprinted a hundred meters. It really, really was some it was alien. And where the power generation was coming from was the wrong place and how I was trying to issue force at which point I was using force and which point I was I wasn't was all off and my breathing, I was holding my breath. But that shaking after just persevering and persevering started just things started clicking when I was doing my my elements for example the first thing that clicked was Hung Chuan um, crossing it just clicked one day I was just doing Hung Chuan and that same motion from the shaking just exploded out and I oh okay this makes sense so the big spear is a really really good tool can you put into words the uh, body mechanics required for that kind of a shaking power well, if we talk, because we have quite a few, we have a lot of shaking power, a lot of shaking exercises, and uh, 
there's also a lot of other techniques. But if we just talk about the standard shake that a lot of people do know, where you basically got your your two hands holding the spear, you know, in front of your chest, basically an arm's length horizontally, with a tip pointing to let's say the left side, up to the left. Um, the first thing that we got to learn is that you're not supposed to use your arms, which is kind of uh, it's kind of difficult initially. So you've got to really have the correct stance, uh, the correct weighting. Both feet have to be firmly planted on the floor. Your legs should also be slightly bent. They shouldn't be straight. Basically, your hips start moving left and right and on the axis of your spine. And you try to get this force to travel from your feet up through your, your, your midsection out into, into your arms and affect the tip of the spear. The difficulty in that is that once you've shaken in one direction, the spear starts to recoil back in the other direction, and you've actually got to be ahead of that recoil at all times. That's where the difficulty comes in. So it's a matter of being relaxed enough to stay ahead of that recoil, but strong enough to give enough force to reach the end of the spear and keep the momentum going. And it really is a type of a whipping motion with your hips, with your waist and your hips, I guess that's uh, my best attempt at trying to explain it. Yeah. You know, when I first started studying some weapons with uh, someone who said he was an internal arts master and actually probably wasn't, um, he talked a lot about extending your chi through the end of the weapon, but he didn't explain that at all. And it seems to me that some of the body methods and body mechanics is actually what you're trying to accomplish here, and yet... There are people who misinterpret, who take that literally and believe that a mystical energy is going through their body up to the end of the weapon. Have you come across that kind of belief? Yeah, and we come across it a lot with even Chinese people that come to, you know, to see my teacher and to maybe discuss training or to come and stop training with them. They've got this funny idea that they're going to come and learn some magical power and they'll start uh, discussing this idea of chi in a mystical way that they've kind of maybe looked in a book or looked online and thought this is what they really need to be talking about you know this is this is the real deal we don't really talk about chi in that sense and my teacher says his teacher never spoke about chi in that sense either chi in that sense it was a word or a catchphrase used to describe a whole lot of things it wasn't and it wasn't magical power but it was a lot of elements if we take physical action, there's two elements to it, of course. There's the body moving, and then there's, there's what's going on on the inside, uh, which is the mental aspect to it. I mean, we should rather talk about the internal. I mean, if we're talking about internal martial arts, there are internal aspects, and there's so many things that are involved there. Just as much as if you talk about the external aspects, there's muscles, there's ligaments, there's bones, there's driving and momentum, and all of these things. When you talk about the internal elements, there's... Uh, well, energy, there's spirit, there's mentality, there's emotion, there's feeling, there's personality. Mindset. Exactly. All of these things are what you would say the unseen or the internal aspects. And Xi plays heavy, heavy influence on these, these elements, specifically Yi, which is intent, which we consider the governor or the, the general of all the others. If you can control that general... All the others are going to follow, and you don't have to name them. Who cares what they're called? If it's called chi or whatever, well, there it is. I mean, so Ishini is very, very heavy on, on that, that both the physical and the intent or the internal elements in terms of what I've just spoken about have to be developed very fully. And we've got methods to do it, but there's no magic power. At the end, all we're doing is we're unifying these two aspects to such a degree that they help each other. Um, not separate them. I think too many people try to separate these things, and then and, and instead of training, they're sitting and talking about uh, mystical powers. Uh, I mean, when two people interact, even in a combat point of view, there's before their arms and legs clash, there's spirit, there's emotion, there's all sorts of internal things that are already perceivable, never mind by your opponent, but by you yourself in terms of what's going on in your body. And if you can't rein those in and control them, you're going to lose no matter how skilled you are. So these are really important elements, but, you know, the way today people talk about chi and the misunderstanding, I think that's one of the biggest downfalls of internal martial arts today. 
I agree. I spend a lot of time trying to uh, overcome some of that silliness. So as you're learning the five elements and Santi and progressing through with your teacher, at what point do fighting applications come in? Does he make them a key part of his instruction? Yes, um, and specifically, there is a formula that you should follow in terms of knowing when it's time to start introducing these. He'll start talking about basic ideas already with individual techniques, because if you understand the basic idea behind a technique's application, it changes your yi or your intent that you use in that technique. And then where there needs to be focus or where there needs to be uh, different aspects of motion emphasized, you will know because you've got a basic idea of these applications. So that's, he'll start doing that already from the beginning. But in terms of developing fighting techniques, you'll start to go, you know, once you start getting into partner exercises, you'll start first by doing set partner exercises. We've got a whole lot of duelian, which are set routines that you do with a partner. I would say these are baby steps to free fighting. We first learn how to crawl, then we learn how to walk, and then we start running, and then maybe you enter a race. Uh, a lot of people try to enter the race a little bit too early. They don't know how to crawl or walk just yet. His method is quite clear that, uh, well, yes, you'll start to be introduced to these applications, but to start freely using them, uh, there's a progress. Uh, and if you're not comfortable even to do them in set routines yet, and you don't have a basic understanding of these set routines, partner routines I'm referring to, uh, we won't go into free sparring yet because it's just going to become a mess. He's got a method that, that we go through. Yeah, that's basically how, how it goes. But he is very combat oriented. Do you help teach at this point? Uh, at times, um, generally I don't like to. Um, I'm not uh, the biggest fan of using my training time to teach somebody else. Do you plan on becoming a, a teacher? My plan involves the following. Tomorrow I'm going to wake up and it's, I'm going to train. <laughs> That's about as much planning as I put into my martial arts. As, maybe one day I will. Maybe one day I will. But it's not anything that I've actually planned. I was going to ask you, uh, because of that, I, I think I saw you... Uh, going through some movements with a couple of students in the documentary I watched. But uh, what are some of the most common weaknesses or mistakes you see in Jingyi students? Common mistakes are to, first is not understand the structure or not even feel the structure because understanding the structure and, and imitating what, what the teacher tells you where your hands and feet should be is a different story to feeling it. So I think the first thing is there's a bit of a disconnect that a lot of people don't have a feeling of the correct structure. They're trying to imitate a structure. Um, so that's the first thing. The, the other thing is they try to rush it a little bit. It's very much a coordination issue with Xingyi, with coordinating your hands and your feet, your stepping and your timing, your issuing of force, your drawing of force to, to, to uh, winding, basically in a sense winding up this whole process is quite uh, involved and a lot of times I find that people rush it and everything is off, but they're not attuned to see that it's off. They think that it's actually quite correct. I mean, incidentally, for the International Wushu Federation, and this is one of the things that I did from, from my, I became a member of the technical committee in 2011. I was pushing to put traditional events in the world championships and as of this year, this year's world championships will feature Xingyi, Bagua, Dadao, or which is the Guandao, commonly known as Guandao, and Shuangjian. But my drive was to put Xingyi and Bagua in there because I personally feel that uh, Wushu athletes should uh, be exposed to those traditional styles. And if I put it in the world championships, maybe they'll be driven to practice those styles. And if you want to get a decent result in Xingyi trend, well, then maybe you should stand in Santi Shir for a bit and work on your structure. And if that's being done, well, maybe your your flowery fist that you do in your long fist routine might get improved because you'll be ex you know you'll you'll have seen or experienced something else. So, with that drive in mind, we started to have coaches courses this year for international coaches in Xingyi and Bagua. And while I did teach there, I wouldn't say that that is me becoming a teacher. That is just me doing what we're doing for the drive or the Wushu movement. How many hours a week do you work uh, in your job with the Federation? Generally, um, one of the key things when they, they opened this Beijing office about a year and a bit ago, and then they wanted me to work there. Before that, I was doing a lot of work for them. Uh, I was involved in the 2012 Olympic bid, 
So I was doing a lot of work for them, basically from home. We didn't have an office in Beijing. We had a headquarters in Lausanne, Switzerland. They opened a Beijing office in two, last year, and uh, then they wanted me to work there. But I, I made it very clear that my number one purpose is that I'm here in China because I'm close to my teacher. And secondly, even if that wasn't the case, I still need my time for my practice. So if they're willing to understand that I'm still going to practice every day, of course, if there's emergencies, if there's serious projects, then I'll devote the time that's required. But a lot of the time I work from home and I go into the, into the actual office about uh, three days a week. The rest of the time I'll work from home on projects and practice. You know, it seems to me in talking with you that you sort of represent a true martial artist. You're there to learn the art and do what you can to learn without really uh, plans to uh, convert it into a money-making venture. That's quite unusual, it seems. I, I, well, I'm, I, well, thanks for, for, for saying that, but I don't think people should get into martial arts if they think it's uh, a means to an end financially, <laughs> because there are, there's easier ways to make money. I've always found that notion quite strange. I've always found it strange, especially even when I was teaching, when I was teaching wushu sport in South Africa, that a new kid would come into the school and in week one he'd say his goal is he wants to become a teacher. And I was like, okay, but didn't you come here because you actually want to do this stuff? I mean, isn't that, isn't that the first goal is to do it because you want to do it? So I found that, I always find that quite strange when people immediately start talking about, uh, about teaching. Yeah, in America, the number one question is, how long does it take to get a black belt? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think that's uh, something that happens. Even, you know, to be honest, don't you don't don't think China is uh, a lot different. Your average person here thinks the same way. Uh, not about black belts, but about uh, oh look, I've taken a picture with with this guy, and I've attended uh, two or three classes. So you know, I'm a Xingyi guy now. I mean, or uh, I, it's it's just human behavior, I guess. I think that's the the average human behavior. And what people don't realize, and this is something that I've given a lot of thought to over the last few years, is we're trying to popularize martial arts. And in today's day and age, it's easier to popularize martial arts. So that means a lot more people are getting involved in martial arts. And the majority of these people will act like the majority acts. Whereas in the past, it wasn't the majority that would rise up and practice martial arts. It was the minority that would do this. So I think this is one of the key differences in, in mentality. Uh, the majority mentality versus the minority mentality is, is quite different. And, uh, well, this is why you see these kind of people and more of them today. In the United States, MMA has become very popular. And as a result, I think it has hurt the traditional martial arts. Do you see any of that mentality in uh, China? And is the... Um, culturalization of younger Chinese people having an impact on their involvement in martial arts as they maybe become a bit more westernized? Well, the first thing about the MMA in China, it actually hasn't really taken off. So the threat to martial arts in China is not so much MMA. It's, uh, it's other things. Firstly, it's school. I think school here is one of the biggest threats to Chinese martial arts or any endeavor. They hammer these kids with classes all day and hammer them with homework all night. That they, 99% of them don't have any time to do anything physical. So that's one of the biggest problems here. Unless you're in a professional environment and you've been thrown into a professional school, and by the way, the majority of those kids thrown into it hate martial arts. They're not there because they want to be there. Um, they're put in there by their families or for certain reasons. If they're not in that environment, they really don't have time to, to practice. Uh, once they finish school, they go to university, they've got to try to get a job. And jobs here, getting a job is really, really difficult. A large portion of uh, university graduates don't get a job within the first couple of years. A lot of them don't get a job that they, they intended to get. So. Once they've got the jobs, they're worked to death. And that's why I mean when I was saying earlier about the breakdown of society, it doesn't give the youth a lot of time to think about this. And honestly, they don't think it's impo important. There are a few people that after time they have some time to come and practice. But to be honest, by that time, a lot of them are physically broken or they've never had any physical level to begin with. So 
in that sense, I'd say modernization, westernization, and uh, work. The, the way of life here is the biggest threat to the survival of traditional martial arts. That's, that's what's happening here. How does your teacher survive? He was never formally employed as a martial arts teacher, much like, uh, much like a lot of the tr folk or traditional martial arts teachers here. He worked in a factory and uh, trained either in the morning or after work or both. And when he was in school, it was before school and after school. It was a different generation, though, his, his generation. And it just kind of grew from there. I mean, he was just more and more involved in Chinese in, in practice. He became more well-known in China, at least. They, so he's also Li Ziming's uh, Bagua disciple. And Li Ziming became famous when he unearthed Dong Hai Chuan's tomb and moved it. And they had created the Beijing Bagua Research Association, which was the first single style Chinese Martial Arts Association in China. At that time, there wasn't a single style association. There was the Chinese Wuxia Association, but this was the first single style uh, association. He was uh, involved in there. Following that, there was the Sanquang Paltre Association, which was the second single style association in Beijing. And the third was the Xinyichuan Research Association, which he was also involved in to help establish and that. So he started to become a little bit more well-known in the Shimi and uh, the public Shimi circle. Then things grew from there, but he retired as a factory worker and he just continued to teach. Uh, after his DVDs, his books came out, people started looking for him. So he's actually formally retired, but he still teaches. Uh, Wushu has been a part of his life since he was a child and nothing's changed. That's his way of life. So when we see a DVD such as uh, his DVDs, does he get any money from that at all? You know, that, that's actually a really sore point. And, uh, because I, I suspect they don't get a penny. I'll be frank and honest with you. They paid them, these kind of, this company paid them, and uh, that company has got quite a few teachers that have done sets of DVDs. At that time, they paid them something like a thousand renminbi per DVD, and that was it. How much would that be in dollars? Well, it's divided by six today, so not, not even, not much, not much. And the agreement was that these DVDs were to be sold in China, but you can see these DVDs being distributed and sold by them internationally. If I was a lawyer, because I really got pissed off when I heard about this, if I was a lawyer, I would have done something. But in China, law, and it's a totally different thing. My teacher, you know, he takes it all with a pinch of salt. It is what it is. And he looks at it in the positive. He's a very positive guy. He says, well, thanks to the DVDs, more people know about me. So Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I found one of my books is being sold, uh, on, or not sold, but given away on BitTorrent, and that really uh, kind of bothered me. And, and you almost have to take the idea that, well, you'll be better known. Yeah. Maybe that'll drive people to uh, other DVDs or eBooks or uh, online. I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, I, I see that with the Chen people. I see it with all these other artists. And you know they're being ripped off. Yes. They are, and here they definitely are in China. Well, you know, like you were saying, there's actually a part, there is always a silver lining if you look for it. I remember my teacher telling me that, uh, I can't remember which one of his martial brothers had released a book, but this guy hadn't really trained much. I mean, out of all of them, he was the one who had trained the least. And he had released a, a book on, on one of the styles. I, I can't remember if it was a Bagua book, possibly nationally here in China. And the, his other brothers got together and they were like, you know, this guy, he did this and he's trying to claim that he's the best disciple of this person and look at him, he doesn't even know what he's doing and he's released a book. And my teacher said, you know what, irrespective of who he is, irrespective of his level, he's promoting our art, whether you like it or not, his book out there is promoting our art. It's more than anybody else has done just by sitting here and squabbling. So, you know, in that sense, he's got a point. Uh, in that sense, he's got a point. And that's a lot of the way that I look at wushu sport. I mean, the, the more I've been involved in traditional martial arts, the more I'm at odds with the idea of sport, trying to shape martial Chinese wushu into sport. But I find and I feel it's like the PR, the public relations and promotion of traditional wushu. If I can get 100 people to start practicing wushu because they're interested in 
Jet Li movies or Wushu Sport or something. And from that hundred, one of them continues with traditional martial arts after he's either finished his competitive career or at some point. I feel that's a win. I think that's a good thing. Why do you study? Why do you practice? You're not studying so you can beat people up on the street, defend yourself necessarily, are you? Well, you know, I, I like to think of Chinese wushu as a multifaceted practice. Self-defense is definitely an aspect that everybody can get benefit from. Well, of course, if you've got the correct teacher. But there's so much more to it. I find that I get uh, a lot of physical, emotional, and spiritual joy from my practice. It's something that is much like eating food. Uh, you feel a bit funny if you haven't had a meal today. I feel the same way with my practice. It's, uh, it's just something that's become so part of my life and so beneficial to my life that I just don't think there would be a time that I could say, okay, I'm done with that. There's no more point to practice anymore. It's just become such an integral part of my life that I just can't see living any other way. I hear you. I, you know, I lost a lung a few years ago, and I was near death once, Ouch. and even a couple of months ago, I was in intensive care for a couple of days and in the hospital for a week total. And occasionally I've said something like, you know, I'm not sure how much longer I can keep going in this. And, and my wife says, uh, but that's who you are. That's right. I can't imagine not doing something and not practicing, even if I can just move a little bit at some point, which I've, I've recovered but uh, a little bit. But it is part of who you are at some point. It is about fighting, but it's not about fighting. And it helps me connect exactly with people around me in my opinion yeah that's it i mean a lot of my practice and uh you know where i live in beijing a lot of my practice when i'm not with my teacher is alone uh, if i'm not with my teacher and my brothers i train very isolated i try to find a very there's a space behind my my where in my neighborhood uh, that's still kind of uh, natural that's uh, a lot of trees and there's a little believe it or not there's a little sheep farm next to it I go in there and the peace I get from going in there, when I come out, I feel very centered. I feel like it doesn't matter what happens today, I'm, I'm pretty good, I'll face it, it's okay. It's when I don't go in there and do that, that I come out and then the, the smallest thing might set me off. You're right, it's, it's who you are. I mean, it's made me the person I am today and it's made you the person you are today. Does philosophy play a part in your teacher's instruction? Yes. Um, my teacher is, uh, what's special about him is that, first of all, he's the youngest child of quite a few kids, and he's an old generation. His dad was born in the Qing Dynasty. His oldest brother has already passed away. He was 20 odd years older than him. So he spans a few generations with his mentality and his upbringing. His way of study from his teacher was also an old generation, and Li Ziming, who was a highly educated and old generation uh, practitioner of Bagua, comes from the whole package. You know, he was taught the martial, he was taught the philosophical, he was taught the cultural aspects of it. And really, they, they really do help each other. All of these aspects help each other. I mean, we're doing what you and anybody who's doing uh, Chinese martial arts and specifically internal arts is they're doing a type of physical philosophy. They really are. And it's something that is really part of the training. The philosophy, the, the, the concepts of, uh, you could say it's Chinese philosophy, but it's so, it's human philosophy that are ingrained in there. Yeah, he, he teaches quite philosophically. He also can, uh, because he can read classical Chinese, and I don't mean traditional characters, I mean classical Chinese. The way the words are ordered is totally different. You won't know really what they're talking about, even if somebody reads it to you. Modern Chinese people can, you know, if they don't know, if they haven't understood that, they won't understand what's, uh, what's being said. So he's got a very solid base from which he teaches, and uh, philosophy is part of it. Is there anything we haven't touched on that you think uh, is important for this interview for people to know or for Xingyi students to work on, uh, other, other internal artists to understand about Xingyi or Wushu? I hope people can take a more serious look 
at what these internal arts really are, what Xing is, what Bagua is, uh, what they've come through to be what they are today, and not try to oversimplify it and misunderstand it in some form of magic or something that is not, as I just said, philosophical, because it really is a special thing that has very deep roots, it's very well defined and very well developed in all aspects. It's developed as a form of combat, it's very well developed as a form of spiritual cultivation, it's very well developed as a form of philosophy and cultural study. It's very well developed as something that's going to make you healthy, because it really is going to make you healthy. It's very well developed as something that's going to keep you entertained and, and give you a, a goal in that sense to strive towards. And that's my wish that uh, more people can, can see it for what it really is. It really is a lifelong endeavor. Yes, it is. I was practicing last night with a couple of students and we were working on a Bagua forum and it just struck me again and again just how frustrating it is trying to get it right after years of practice. They didn't seem to have it right. I didn't feel like I had it right. And that, in a way, is something that keeps me practicing this quest. You, you, you always want to be better than the guy you were yesterday. That's, <laughs> yeah. our, that's our goal. I mean, if you're feeling, oh, good, I've got it, well, you're not going to develop anymore. I mean, one of the things that I, I find quite, quite interesting is there's, there's a few little bits and pieces of video that I can find of my teacher that was probably filmed maybe 20, 30 years ago. And looking at him today and say, well, that's like a different person. And at that point, he had already been practicing. I mean, he was recognized as, a, you know, a master. I mean, he, he, he studied a, a very long time with his teachers by then already. But to look at that person compared to the person he is today, it's like chalk and cheese. And, and that's what I look at and I think, this guy is putting me on his shoulder and trying to push me up to surpass him even. It's a responsibility that I, that I think, you know, deserves a little bit more attention than, than even sometimes I feel I'm giving it. I really enjoy talking with you. I, I tell you, the people I have on this podcast are martial artists and uh, just dedicated, and it's just a pleasure to talk with you. And I hope to talk to you again if we can come up with other topics, uh, and I'm sure we will. But is there a website, or where do we go for more information on your teacher, on uh, on you? Well, um, I made an English, and well, it's got a couple of other languages on it, website for my teacher. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to maintain and put new things on it, but it's a basic place that people can read about him and uh, send a message if they're trying to contact him, because that was the problem I had. I couldn't find him. So I made this website so people could contact him. Uh, the emails come, the messages come to me, so you can write in English, and then I will translate them for him. It's not a problem, and I'll send them on to him. It's www.diguoyongwushu.com. One word, diguoyong as in his name, and then wushu, all one word, dot com. I will put that link on my uh, blog and on my Facebook page, and I'll uh, include it in the description of the podcast. So uh, I hope it... Uh, raises more awareness of him and congratulations on having the opportunity to train and good luck with you and I'm sure we'll talk down the road too. I'm looking forward to it and then I just wanted to say the reason why you attract such good guests and such real martial artists is because you are one yourself so uh, birds of a feather so I think you're, you're the reason why people are being attracted to not only the show but to talk to you and interact with you. Well thank you my friend and uh, I will talk to you later. Have a good day. You too. Thank you. Well, there's another inspirational interview for you. What do you think, Hung Lo? What we should do is practice right now. Great. Let's get started. What time is it? Time for you to leave. Time for me to leave. I just love this time of year when it stays daylight longer. It means we can practice outside longer. I hope you'll keep suggesting new guests. You can reach me through the Internal Fighting Arts Facebook page or email me at ken at internalfightingarts.com. Until next time, practice hard, stay humble, and above all, remain centered at all times. Thank you for listening to the Internal Fighting Arts Podcast with Ken Gullett. For more instruction and information that will deepen your knowledge and skill, 
follow Ken's Internal Fighting Arts Facebook page. Also, keep up to date on the blog at internalfightingartsblog.com and try two weeks free on the online school. Members can stream more than 700 video lessons, download ebooks, and get personal coaching from Ken. Go to internalfightingarts.com. <laughs>